Welcome to Work the Left Side. Uh, Hello, hi, thanks for having me. Guest is the uh, the Canadian cowboy, Mr. Tim Strange. Yeah. How are we doing, mate? Yeah, good. Uh, the Lone Star. The, That's yeah. it. Well, yeah, I'm good, man. How are you? Are you good? Yeah, man, I'm, I'm five by five. I'm all good. Good, 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 good. Fine. Um, yeah, man, obviously, you know, uh, it's been a few months in the make. It seems like it's probably as I kind of arrange these episodes way in advance and then I'm really hyped to talk to people and it just needs to be ages off and then it comes. I'm like, yes, I finally get to speak to you. Yeah, um, it's it's so, kicked around pretty quickly, I thought, because we spoke about it before and then it just sort of gets and then you have a lot of good guests and stuff on and, and I was just like, oh, yeah, that's it. And then before you know, it was like, oh, yeah, it's free this week. Yeah, yeah I could do it any, any night. Yeah, I'm good. But that's it, know, it's, it's good. You do a lot of oh. podcasts, so I've listened to a lot of them. I love really? I've mostly listened to the ones that mentioned me. Anyone that mentions me, I tend to tune in to, but everyone else, I listen to a few others as well. So it's oh, good. It's, it's good. To be fair, man, You've, uh, your name's popped up quite a lot recently, obviously, you know, Mr. Uh, Gunnar Rigg, I think, dropped. You were talking about your... We always talk yeah. about, obviously, the PPW match. Obviously, yeah. you had, uh, you know, your carpool karaoke partner in crime on a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, he's killing it. I was just speaking to him before I came on. Uh, so he's doing well over in Philly, living the dream. He's so, still there, yeah? Uh, he's flying back now, so he'll be on his way back. He's home tomorrow, so... Nice. It's good. So the, um, good. I was happy for him, man. I saw that he got to run the steps and he got to do the little... Oh, he did yeah, the rock moment. Absolutely smashed over there. I couldn't be happier for him. He's such a great guy. So it's it's when good people like that go and do good things. You're like, fucking right, get in. Get yes. in. It's good to see. But, so. you know, good people there. You know, good man yourself. So obviously, yeah. you know, like I sort of said, you've, you've popped up a lot recently. Um, I've seen you around a lot recently as well. You need yeah. to be. Uh, I've seen you. I've seen you at True Grit. Um, you know, you've been smashing it. Uh, oh, well, another reason you popped up as well was Mr. Isaac North last week. Yes, uh, talking yes. about your match at Rise. Yeah, which the was, best kind of match. So they're always the fun matches they have. Just go in and beat the fuck out of each other for a bit and have a good time. <laughs> that's it. That's, that's what you said. He was like, first five way. minutes. Just slap the shit out of each other, and then we'll worry about the, you know, the wrapping it up towards the end kind of thing. But to the st- for the start of the match, yeah, let's just let's just drop chops. Well, that's it. That's it. Right. That's what people want to see, though. Just chopping the shit out of each other. Each other, each other. So the big thing for me is like I, I watch a lot of the old shoots. So I'm like an old school wrestling fan. So I watch a lot of the old shoot interviews on YouTube, and I was listening to the Sid Vicious Psycho Sid talker, and he was saying how. He turns up to these house shows in WCW and Dean Malinko, we said, and Chris Benoit were saying, oh, I do a good drop toe hold, I do this, I do that. And Sid Vicious is like, well, not tonight, you don't. What I'm going to do is go in, beat the shit out of you for a bit. You're going to tag out, I'm going to beat the shit out of your partner for a bit. I'm going to power by me both, I'm going to pin you both, and then we're done. And that's it. And he explains it, how like when people watch your highlight reels online or when you, when you people watch your videos and watch these things, they see you for what they want to see. So when they buy a ticket, they go, I want to go see this. They're expecting Isaac North and Tim Strange to go in and chop the shit out of each other. So if you went in and did something other than what they're expected to see, there's that sort of disappointment on their levels where they just go, oh, this is really, it was all right, but it wasn't what I was expecting to see when I seen Isaac North versus Tim Strange. So they both know we're, we're both big guys who, who like to throw a few chops about. So, it makes sense when he went out there just to do it, but Isaac's a dream to work, so he was great to work with and, and things like that. So, you know what I mean? And, and, and puts together some stuff, so it's always nice when you work with people like that and who aren't afraid to give it as well as take it, you know what I mean? And, and give it back and forth at the same sort of intensity, I would call it. Yeah. So it's, oh, uh, you know what I mean? It's, it's nice. Whereas I get some people don't like that sort of stuff, but for me, it's I, as, as real as can get. I like to feel it when I'm out there, but not tomorrow. Do you know what I mean? That's what it's, I tend to tell guys. That's it. It's your bread and butter, like you sort of said. You know, well, it is it. what it says on the tin. Um, yeah, you know, that's the thing about obviously about a wrestling show. You know, people are getting booked to do certain things. You know, you're you're not getting booked to have a technical match. You know, they'll have somebody else on the card that does that. You're there to be the big guy that just freaking. You know, well, that's it. That's people. it. They want you in there to do what you do. You know what I mean, and and go out and 
beat people up and have a have a scrap and that's it. They don't want me to go out and do a technical wrestling match or this match or that match. They just want to see me go out and have fun and, and wrestle. So that's I don't know, though, dude. In fairness, I'm saying that if I right next time if I see you in the match and you start doing some chain wrestling, I'm going to pop huge. I'll just like that. I'll do a, I'll do a wrist lock next time I'm a wrestler. <laughs> yeah. Just a pull arm wrist lock. That's it. Oh yeah, got him, got him now, <laughs> got him. So I mean, obviously talking about that. Um, I mentioned you know Lou earlier. Um, yeah, yeah. That that match at True Grit, you know. Yeah. Loved that match. Um, again, just you two. Obviously, you guys trust each other. You know each other. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Chops, 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 building up to the slam. You know, that's the whole story of the match was him trying to slam you. Yeah. Um, yeah, loved it. No, it's, it's, it's always sort of, a, it's an easier story to tell. So the two in the family audiences, and I, I try to do the matches where it's as simple as, fair enough when it's 18 plus, you, you try to make it a bit more intense, a bit more full on. But when it's like a family or audience, you want to make sure the kids understand what's going and if they understand this guy can slam him, he can slam him. Then when you're on the up and you're saying, you know, nobody slams me, you know, we can slam. And you know what's coming. And all the adults know, oh, he's going to get slammed. But the kids don't believe it could happen until it happens. Then you get the pop. Then you get that 2.37 star pop. That's it. It is simple. But that's, uh, wrestling at its core, that is what it is. <laughs> It's storytelling. It, it can be the most basic storytelling, but if it's done right, if it's done well, you know, yeah. it does the job and yeah. it gets a reaction. And as you sort of said, you know, you get that pop. As soon as Lou picked you up and slammed you, you know, it wasn't just yeah, the kids, it. even the adults who knew it were coming. Yeah. You know, they still pop. Well, that's it. I mean, it's, it's, it takes you right when you're a kid. Like my, my little boy now, he'll want to watch Andre Hogan, you know what I mean, all the time. And he'll watch it and he'll know what's coming, but he likes to see Hulk Hogan fight Andre the Giant and he knows the giant and can slam and then he slams the giant. He's buzzing with it and he's wanting to slam me and I'm saying, it doesn't work like that. You can, I'm not putting him over. He's, <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. He's, he's too green. He's too green. Maybe, maybe, maybe for, maybe in a, like a retirement match, you know, when he can... Maybe, maybe he can in a few years, exactly, if he's that lean, <laughs> take the hat off me and wear it and carry on. Grow a moustache. I mean, grow a moustache. You can have it. So, that's it. There you go. That's the rite of passage. That's it. Pass the moustache on to the next generation of strange cowboy and send them out into the world. I mean, we're talking about, you know, like, yeah, storytelling and stuff like that. Obviously, you know, I mentioned earlier um, with Gunnar Rig, you know, that uh, that yeah. match of PW. Um, I just, dude, I mean, you're on about, you know, you get booked on a show, you're in a show, you know, people know what to expect. Uh, as soon as comedy match was mentioned for that one, there wasn't what people was expected. Like, <laughs> no, I think, I think the placement. Like I'm always a big sort of for me. It's knowing your place on the card, and everybody has a place on the card when you're when you're wrestling that time. Now, the PPW is full of great talent. A lot of new guys coming through PPW can't sing their praises enough. Nathan's a great guy. Liam's a great guy. People who are in charge run the place properly. Everybody's welcome to a, to a degree, and everyone's put up the you know what I mean? It puts the work in, it puts the effort in, and gets the rewards for doing so. And I remember that that show. I think we were on just before the cybernetico. I believe it was like an eighteen man tag match with loads of variety and loads of stuff going to happen, and and loads of serious wrestling. You know, and you have big guys like Kemper in there, and you have people like Liam wrestling on there, the music man. And you have all these different guys from PPW, different characters, different personalities going into this massive match. You're going. Yeah, we gotta do something that's gonna sort of chill them a bit, relief relieve the temper I like lower the temperature a bit for them to bring it back up again for the final. So that's what we did. And I think it worked well with Radu being a vampire and and it's sort of we just messed on a bit, like, oh, he's gonna bite our necks at both points and we're gonna think we're turning the vampires so to get the advantage. And it was all sort of daft stupidness, but I think those are the types of when you're doing the show like that and you're in that sort of friends and family sort of environment where everyone's there to get their reps in and everyone's there to put the work in and, and have a bit of fun with it and you have that sort of freedom to go out and be silly a bit, it's nice to sort of have it and go out and have fun with it. So it's like, I know everyone was riding me on the ropes. You had the referees and, and people like that and everybody who wanted to 
had a, had a ride me on with my hat on and stuff. And it was it was a good little moment, a good little laugh. And then we went on, you know. But it, it was good fun. I mean, I've, I've wrestled Lou countless times now. I've only wrestled with Radu and, and Rig that one time. That's the only time we've ever been in together. But I thought the clash, is, there's not really a clash of styles, but it's like if we went out there and just smacked the shit out of each other for, for 15, 20 minutes, it would be like then the crowd have to know an 18-man tag match, which is a serious match for, for the title and things like that, you know, and... Well, you know I me. Mean? Why do we just want to go out and do a big serious match before another big serious match? We want to relieve the tension so they can bring it back up again. And I always think there's too many people try to go out and have a main event when they're second on the card and do everything, and then there's nothing left for the main event to do. And by the time they see the main event, they're all burned out because everything they could have seen in the main event has already been done in five matches before because people haven't planned the matches and people don't know what position they are on the card or what their responsibility is for that position on the card. And that's uh, that's annoying. But at the same time, it goes back to the importance of proper training facilities. Like you've got, like, up here, we've got Northern Grafters, we've got Rampage, we've got PPW, we've got WAW facility down south. You've got loads of great schools in Scotland. You've got uh, PPW, we've got a school up there. Uh, W3L have got a school up there. There's Target Wrestling in Carlisle. They run a school, a training school. So it's like there's a number of different ways you can go out there. And I probably forgot about 10 decent training schools that uh, if I stood here just listed the places you can go and get properly trained, I'd be here all night. But it, it's one of those things where it's it's teaching this, not just how to do the moves and how to do this, but the right times to do them. The, the importance of storytelling and psychology is key. The importance of using a referee correctly is key because I'll, I'll get on that a bit later. But there's a lot of referees out there that need need their dues. Like, you know what I mean? Like they, you got Scott Bell, you got Ross, you got Reese, you got Katie Crosby, you got Scott, you got you know what I mean? There's, there's so many people. Swift, you got Rich, like there's so many good referees. But then when they go out there. People again are not using the referees properly. They're not using them for what they're there to do. They help enhance the story, to tell the story, to create that sort of impartial divide, and using the mind to do that. So for me, it's like a credit that if you got a good referee, for me, I can carry a poor opponent or a green opponent or someone who's new to the business to an all right match or a good match. You know what I mean? Having known the experience that I have and things like that, you put me in with a good referee, we can make that a great match. Do you know what I mean? You put me in there with a bad referee and it brings the quality down because now I'm not carrying I'm carrying the referee and I'm carrying the opponent. And you're like, all right, come on, now work with me here. i got to have someone working with me in the match. Do you know what I mean? And that, that's so that I don't think it's any fault of anybody who's green. Or, and I don't think it's a fault of a lot of the new guys coming through because a lot of the new guys get it when you tell them the importance of the flow of the match, the importance of the story, the psychology. But I think back in the day when I was trained up and and you were doing a lot of shows like with the Knights, and you were doing shows with people like Drew McDonald, experienced hands, who were who were about. They would tell you straight, you know, we no no sugarcoating it, no taking you to one side and saying, you know, you need to work on that. It was that was fucking shit, you know. I mean, this is why it was fucking shit. This is how you're gonna make it better. Don't do that again. You know what I mean? And then you go, well, I'm not gonna do that again, am I? Because I don't want that to happen again. And then you go out and you improve, and I think that's the best way to do it. For a lot of people, that's how I learned. Because if someone came to me and said, you know what, Tim, that didn't really work. You, you know, you just try to do something different next time. Well, that's not helping anyone. Like, if you say that, it was fucking shit, man. What you need to do is go out and do this. This is why it didn't work. This is what you want to do. This is why it didn't work. This is how to do it next time to make it a bit better. And that's how you, you, you're improving people. But I think there's too many people don't know it, that they're going out and just being shit and it's not their fault but it then impacts the know. show as a whole because people need to know that your position on the car and like if you're the first match on the car it's normally a fast paced match something with the the lower guys good guy bad guy quite simple to get the grasp of it bam 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 quick pace get it in boom 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 big high spots or whatever not high spots but big fast mover match action pack get people into the show get the crowd warmed up and hot for the show you know what I mean and then it just slowly builds up from there but like, there's people times where I've seen 
trainers at shows and I've set up merchandise and I've watched the match grow. And I'm not going to name names or try to bury anyone, but I'm watching the first match of the show and they've done a belt shot and they've done a low blow and they've done six near falls and they've done a top rope finishing move and they've done this and everything kicks out, everything kicks out. They've done running interferences. They've done all this in the first match. And then the, the their trainers go, that was great first match that. I was like, well, how was it a great? Well, what's the main event going to do when it's for the title? Because they've already seen a guy kick out of a belt shot, kick out of a nut shot, kick out of a finisher, kick out of a top row finisher, have on an interference. So where, what are they doing now? Like, what, what are they going to do? And I'm just sitting there going, I'm watching this trainer who's been around a long time, and I'm going, what? What the fuck are you talking about? That was awful for a first match. You know what I mean? It wasn't, it wasn't a good match at all. And then they're going, but this is the guys now who are thinking that's the way you do it because that's how their trainer told them to do it. And then that's where it all goes, the key goes wrong. So it's, but, and I, I'll always give that? feedback. I'll always give feedback to people if they ask me for it. Yeah. But now in today's climate, I don't tend to go up to someone and say, oh, I've watched your match here's my feedback on it unless they want it i don't volunteer it up do you know what i mean but if someone came to me and said oh do you mind watching me match and give me feedback i'm always happy to do that if people want to send me matches to watch someone give them feedback i'm happy to do it but the chances are the problem with it is everybody will go yeah tim you know i really want to come to these shows i really want to get out there i see you're busy all the time i want to come on the road with you i want to do this and i go well fair enough start coming to the shows introducing yourself to the promoters, come out, put the feelers out, see what they need, watch watch their product, see where you think you'd fit in, and then talk to the promoter about it. And then they go, oh yeah, no, that's great, I'll come to that show, I'll come to this show. And then on the day of the show, they go, oh no, man, I can't, I can't do it today, I'm not going to be able to make it this weekend, or I'm not going to be able to do that. And there's very few people that got that grind, that they want to be out there every weekend, and they want to be doing stuff. And I always try to tell people, the best way to be busy is to be busy. Because the more people that see you out there and see you're here, see you there, see you everywhere, you're one more likely to get eyes on you for people to go, yeah, he's good him. Two, you're going to get a lot smoother and sharper in the ring because you're wrestling every every weekend. And three, the diary is going to be full anyway because every time you're out there looking for work, people are going to say, well, I want him on my show. Oh, the only time I can get him on my show is October. You know what I mean? And then they go, can I get you in October then? And already you're starting to fill up. Do you know what I mean? And that, that's the way you want to do it. Yeah, shows get changed or dates get moved and opening positions open up. But then you've got a backlog of people who wanted you. Then you can just go back and say, you wanted me for this date before. The show I had at the time moved dates. So I can't do it anymore. So that's that it's now open. I'm going to give you first refusal because you came to me first. It's up to you whether you want it or not. If you don't want it, I'll put it out in Gen Pop. Do you know what I mean? Put it out on Twitter or something like that, that it's an available date now. But I mean, there's that many people out there that you, that you work with and you do stuff, but then there's loads of people that go to promoters and go, you need to get the dates in quick because I'm very, very busy, but then they have nothing in the diary. And then when people like myself or Lou go to them and say, listen, you need to let us know in advance if you need us for any future shows because our diary is pretty full. They come to us and go, I'm full up now till October. I can do this show if they send you the year's date. Like I can probably do one or two shows in October. Do you know what I mean? And that's that's sort of the way it the way it works. But all the young guys out there wanting to go out there, it's never been easier to get your name out there with social media, with with stuff like that, and to use Instagram to put up. I would say like highlight reels are great and all, but people want to see you put together a full match, and it doesn't need to be a thirty minute main event match. It could be a ten minute just to show that you know the foundations, that you've got something about you, that you've got something different to add to a show. There's no point in being like built like a McDonald's chip and going out trying to be a killer because you're not going to be a killer. You know what I mean? People are going to look at you and go, you know, this guy, just he doesn't, he doesn't look like someone I would want to not want to get hit off. Whereas if you look at other wrestlers and stuff, you can get away with it if you have a bit of build about you, if you're a bit technical, or you put the gimmick around your appearance, around your look. What I tended to do early on in the years, when I first started, was I wrestled as a as a normal guy. I didn't wrestle as a big guy. I wrestled as a... So I was doing technical wrestling. I was doing stuff like that, which I can do. 
but for me, it's like I'm six foot six, near four hundred pounds. I'm not. I'm not a little guy. I'm not a normal sized guy. I'm a big guy. So now, when I started wrestling more as a big guy, that's when I started getting noticed more. That's when I started getting busier because people were going, "That's something the world's missing now. It's missing the real big guys, the naturally big guys, the the big base people." And you've got a lot of big guys coming through, which are great to see because I love wrestling other big guys because it gives you more of a a strong match and things, and you can go in and you can big beady men slapping meat, isn't it? So it's 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 what you want. That's it. I mean, that takes you back. We mentioned Isaac earlier. You know, that's a take kind of thing. And yeah, I mean, I've, I've said before when I've spoken to, I've, you know, I've had the, I've been lucky enough to speak to a lot of the big guys. You know, uh, and I've sort of said every time, you know, until about three or four years ago, there was maybe a handful of big guys on the scene. British wrestling yeah. wasn't really known for the big guys. It was just normal guys, decent build that you know could wrestle kind of thing yeah whereas now you know like you said you mentioned kempo we've got isaac we've got lawson gonna rig uh yeah. there's obviously big t justice you know there's, there's guys out there. <coughs> uh, yeah we've got a selection of these big guys i mean music man's like six foot five or something oh, well yeah. um so yeah there seems to be the, the new breed are uh, a bunch of big boys that's what you want though you need big guys on the show it's a variety show i'm not saying because you're skinny and that you shouldn't be wrestling or because you're you're built like a little little guy you shouldn't be wrestling because you should there's a place there for you but you got to know your gimmick and know your character and know your build and wrestle to your build if you're five foot two weighing 100 pounds you're not going to go out and start picking me up over your head and throw me about you know what i mean because it, physically it doesn't make any sense to anybody that's when you got people like, if you look at it like people like Spike Dudley, people like Mike Whipwreck, people like Rey Mysterio, you know, the small underdogs, people want to see you beat the big guy. How are you going to do it? You need to overcome them and everything you throw at the big guy is not going to work. If you come out and we do 50-50, start training blows 50-50, it just shits on it all. It doesn't make any sense. Why would a big guy who's six foot six, 400 pounds, by the guy who's a quarter of his size and a quarter of his weight and, and go 50-50 with him on, on a, in a fight. It's a, unless it's someone who's like Ken Shamrock, who's got that MMA background, who you know can go out, but he's going to be built properly, not like a little weed. He's going to be built up. You know what I mean? And that, that sort of thing. So I, see, I mean, it's, it's got to be like a 90-10 split kind of thing. You know, 90% of the offense has got to be from the little guy. As soon as the big guy gets one punch, you know, that's that's well, that's, that's it. done kind of thing. It's it's duck and move, duck and move, hit, dodge, you know, the three just rules of dodge. Keep, dodge keep more, dodging you know. them until one eventually you get hit and then, yeah. then you know it. So it's so, uh, like I said, it's <laughs> Kurt Angle get text, like, um, back in the day when Kurt Angle fought, you know, gets the big show. Obviously they could do fifty fifty with big show and Kurt Angle, regardless of the size difference, because it's as you said, the, the, the wrestling the knowledge, the technical knowledge, that's doable. Yeah. But the whole thing about the amateur wrestling background is you use the weight against them anyway. You know what I mean? Kurt Angle would be trained to know how to use his size against them and, and things like that. The same thing with like like a Rey Mysterio would know to use his speed to avoid getting hit and get the hits in, then get out of there, get hits in, then get out of there. And that's how the story you would tell. But it's a, it's not saying that smaller guys shouldn't work or shouldn't be there, or shouldn't be in wrestling, because that's not it at all but it is saying that wrestling is a small guy don't come and pretend to be something you're not because you'll get a lot further being true to yourself and who you are do you know what i mean and then working around what what god what, god, what god's given you do you know what That's, i mean which is it's genuine um like you said before nobody's gonna buy somebody who's like a pepper army being this badass fighter if it if they don't believe it you know yeah play to your strengths be who you are Make it genuine, and you'll get that connection with the fans. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it's all for you. If you're a smaller guy, this is one of the things that people don't realize. If you're a smaller guy, and the whole idea of, of when you're taking getting beat down and stuff like that is to get the sympathy off the audience. You want people to believe, like, oh, he's really getting hurt here. He's really getting beat down here. He's really getting his ass handed to him. And if you're a smaller guy, and it's a big, massive guy getting getting stuck in you and slamming you and throwing you about, and then just laughing at it. The crowd have sympathy then for you, whereas if you're like, oh, I'm just this big killer guy, you're thinking, 
Oh, yeah, simply, it's, it's like, for a big guy, it's a lot, I wouldn't say it's harder playing the face, because I'd enjoy it, but when you're playing the good guy, it's it's a bit more, you've got, if you're, if I'm fighting a small guy who's five foot two, there's something I've got to do to make a mistake to hurt, my, to hurt myself, or, you know what I mean, and then they capitalize on that, but I'm still trying to recover from hurt myself type thing, whereas it's, it, 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 it's all in the story you tell and working to you, you both your strengths and hiding each other's weaknesses. Whereas there's no point in you saying to me, oh, let's go around, go in the ring and, and run 100 miles an hour, help off the ropes, sleep vault, sleep vault, her corona, flip onto your feet, do that, because that, I don't want to do that. You know what I mean? I can't do that. If I wanted to, I couldn't do that. And that's why it's like good, because the, these guys who go out, and there's a lot of amazing, like, high flying guys out there as well, and, 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 and lightweight guys. Like, you know, that can go out and, and wrestle rings around people. And uh, it's it's and they're all smaller stature guys, but they've got a good build about them, they look they've got a good character about them, they're going out there and they're doing playing up to their strengths, hiding the weaknesses, playing up their strengths, and that's all you need to try to do. And if you're in there with them, you know for a fact that they're gonna fly around. But as soon as a big guy catches them, then it's then it's now time, you know what I mean? It's clobbered time, as you'd say, and then that's the the way you'd move on. But that's it. I mean, yeah. I mean, to be fair, you know, it's a story as old as time. It's the classic David versus Goliath. It's yeah, been exactly. done numerous times. It still works. If it's done right, it just makes money. The fans get behind it. Like I said, you know, the small guy gets the sympathy. Um, and yeah, I can imagine being as a bigger guy, it's just like you said, it's just easier working as a heel because you get yeah. to be a bully. You know, everybody hates a bully. You're the big guy, you're picking on the little guy. That's automatic heat. Like I said, the good guy gets automatic, you know, sympathy, yeah. but the bad guy gets automatic heat as well because you're just a big bully and, you know, everybody just wants to see you, you know, get punched or, you know, get beaten. Exactly, exactly. It's very, it's very easy to. The hated guy who you see picking on someone who's smaller than them. Regardless of situation, if you're walking down the road and you see a big guy pushing around a small guy, you're more likely to step in and help him. Then you can, all right, well, he's got to be protected. Whereas when yeah. you look at the, if the other roles are reversed, you go, what's that big guy done to piss him off? Do you know what I mean? It's, it's just the. Uh, <laughs> just the way you just come back and watch and be like, whoa, there you go. You know, he must have deserved it. There's no way the little guy's picked something. Him. Exactly. He's yeah. not going to go pick a fight with him over nothing. And the little guy could be anything. And they go, oh, well, I'm going to step in and try to protect this little guy. He's going to get killed. Oh, yeah, that's the. That's just the gist of it. It's human nature. I think. Yeah. It's the mindset. It's how it conditioned. You know, it is, it is what it is. Uh, I want to rewind um, to. We were talking about, you know, like the opening match just being so yeah. OTT kind of thing where you sort of said, oh, yeah. You know, I think the key thing what I picked up on was when you, you know, somebody saying, oh, it was a good match. You know, it's like, no, it, it, it would have been a great main event, but it's not a good first yeah. match. That's the, that's you know, exactly that's the thing. It's, it's giving the feedback and on. Like, but this a lot of comes from people who promote shows now. A lot of guys out there who promote shows. There's a lot of guys out there who are new to promoting, who get it right and get, get help from the experienced guys. Like, You've got a guy down there, CXW, uh, who I wrestle for down in Essex. Like, uh, Paris, he looks after all the guys. He, he admits to himself, you know, he's not from the wrestling business. He knows business. He's a very good guy. Do you know what I mean? He'll, he'll put the work in to get the people in. I mean, we did a show from the other week with 500 people in. Do you know what I mean? Which is, which is great to see. But he puts the work in. He does door knock and he's out in the town centers, leafling and flyer and everything all the time getting the people out of these shows. But he'll admit that he's not from a wrestling background. He loves wrestling, very passionate about wrestling. But if you go to him and say, well, what about this or what about this? He doesn't shun you. He's listening to you because he wants to learn and get better. And he, he gets advice from the more experienced guys around and, and takes lead from them to say, oh, yeah, this is this, this is that. Do you know what I mean? Because before, I thought he did one Show. And he's even said to me last show we were on, and I'm sure he won't mind me sharing this, but he said that first show he did, his roster was like 30 people or something, 30, 35 people roster. And he's like, we didn't really make any money, but he said, I had a rumble. I wanted a Royal Rumble. And he said, for me, I was a big fan. I just wanted to do a rumble. 
you know what I mean? So he, he loves it, he's passionate about it, but now it's like starting to come around where the roster is shrinking a bit, but it's still the best of Brit rest on there. Like he has a lot of experienced guys, a lot of good guys on there on the shows. So it's 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 good to see him getting all these people together to put these sort of super shows on to highlight the the best that British wrestling have in these categories type thing. And but I mean I'm not saying that you're not good if you're not on CXW, but I'm just saying that's the sort of model he goes. He wants the busy people. He wants the the people that are out there, the people that have been around for a while, that can put on a good match and, and guarantee to put on a good match, whatever he needs them to do, they're happy to do it. It's a very happy locker room. He always puts food on for the guys. He always has drinks in the back for the guys. You know, it's it's always decent venues with decent changing rooms and showers and, and everything. So like, he always looks after people. So I kind of say his praises enough. That's awesome. Um, I'll have to check them out. I don't know too much about them, so I will. I was asked to think as well, you know, there's that much stuff out there. I like to think that I, you know, I, I know some stuff, but that I'm always learning myself, you know, as a fan. So, right, right, that's, that'll be on my list now. Yeah, I'll yeah. Them out. Um, I'll, I'll, yeah, look them up on Twitter and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's the thing as well, though, like you sort of said, you know, um, I think it's, I think it's just that diverse out there. There's that much talent out there. You know, it's, it's easy to, um, I think it's a lot easier now than it was back in the day to have just fill a card full of talented people who have got the variety as well. You know, you can literally make every match different. It and, depends on, on what you what you're wanting to put a card on for. So there's a lot of promoters out there now who just book shows because they can't get booked anywhere themselves. So they run a show, put themselves on it. And then book the show around them as cheap as possible, using other talent that are not really talented people, just to get people in. And a lot of people go like, "Oh, just leave these people to it because they'll fizzle out, or they'll run out of money, or they'll do this and they'll do that." But then a lot of the times, it's it's it. I wouldn't say it kills the town, but if you have a lot of them in the small area, like in the northeast, say, and there's three or four promotions just running. And just, you know, I mean, just running with the same core base of guys who are not really experienced or great guys and are constantly running shows every month, every few weeks and charging five pound a ticket. Families go out to the show. Somebody who doesn't know independent wrestling go out to a show and they're sitting in the crowd by themselves and there's six people in the crowd and you've got these guys going out and killing each other in front of six people and putting on very poor performances and then going all right, well, we probably won't be back here. Do you know what I mean? And then they've got another show that comes to town. It was a decent show, and they put on a, a good effort. And the crowd are like, oh, I'm going to see that rest of the think it'll be better than that last one. And do you know what I mean? That's um, just the, the mentality. So I wouldn't say it kills the towns, but I don't think it helps. Do you know? So if, if, you're, if you want to run it as a business, you want to get the best guys in to do the job, so you're going to have repeat business. If you want to do it because you want to do it as a hobby and pretend like you're a wrestler, be at work on the Monday morning and say, hey, I'm a wrestler. You know, I wrestled three weeks ago and I'm wrestling again in two weeks' time. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's like, yeah, I'm a wrestler. Me, I'm a, he's a wrestler. Him. Because countless times I'll do it and people say to me, oh, do you know such and such? And I'm really good with faces. Like if I see someone and I recognize them from other shows, I'll, I'll know who roughly they are. But unless I, I've been around you a fair amount, the way my memory and stuff is from over the years, it's like I don't really remember a lot of stuff. And sometimes even when I'll remember guys with their face paint on, but if they wash their face, I don't recognize. Do you know what I mean? I think, and who's this guy? And I think that's that's the, the sort of the way it is. And I think it's, it's just one of them things where there's a lot of people out there now who run shows for the wrong reasons. They run shows to try to put the belt on themselves and then make themselves out to be the main eventer. And rather than go to a proper school and train up, go put the reps in, go put the work in and move up to the ranks and do that, they just go, let's book a hall, let's hire a ring, let's make myself a champion. Because that's easier than going and putting the work in, honing my craft and getting good at what I do. I think, but yeah, I mean, I think that's been... Day. I think that's that's been around for a while though, but I, I definitely agree with. I think I, we spoke to this uh, uh, with somebody else. It's like you're sort of saying, you know, like if 
if you're a family and you're shelling out like 30, 40, 50 quid to go watch wrestling, they're new in town, you've never been before. This is the first time you've ever been to the wrestling to a wrestling show and it's shit. That's the first impression, you know. And all shows are shit now to that family. You know, they might not yeah. risk it again and be like, I'm not wasting 50 quid on another one. That's it, we're done. Yeah, you get one shot, really. But that's why they, there's a lot of promotions, though, in the Northeast that are great. I mean, North do a lot of good stuff. Wrestling in Newcastle is probably one of my favourite places to work. I haven't really been there this year yet, but that's only because date clashes and stuff. But the guys who run that, Ryan and Ben, they're, they're great with the guys. They're another guy. They look after people. They make sure. The thing I love the most about their shows, I've told Ben this a hundred times over, is the show starts early. I'm at home eating KFC at half eight. Do you know what I mean? Whereas a lot of these other shows I do is mostly up Scotland way or down south, and it's a three-hour drive. And by the time the show finishes at 10, you're getting in at one or two. And it's, do you know what I mean? It's just one of those things where you then, oh, I'm tired now. I'm, I'm wrecked down. You know, I mean, you're grabbing a sandwich at W. H. Smith at Weatherby Services at one in the morning or whatever. That's not really, do you know what I mean? It's not the same as being home in your bed at ten o'clock at night. It's almost like you never had a show. Do you know what I mean? You go out, do your yeah. match, come home, and it's good. And that's wait until the show finishes, and that's everything. So it's everything's done and dusted. You're home for half eight. You can't really rumble. That's it. As, as I said, man. Yeah, you get to do what you do. Go home, put your slippers on, put your feet up, chill out. And then, yeah, in bed by flipping midnight, and the jobs are good. And you're not warming up some exactly. sort of high in a petrol station somewhere at two o'clock in the morning. Exactly, exactly. But I mean, <laughs> the miles, I don't mind doing. I don't mind doing the miles. People watching the door, well, I'm not going to book people who doesn't want to do it. Like, I'll, I'll do anything. Like, me and Lou were talking about it earlier. That's what we were saying. Cause he, was, he had a really good time over in Philly. I was saying, I was speaking to him about uh, yesterday on the way to a show because I was saying, there's a lot of people don't put the miles in and don't put the graft in what you used to do. They're not, and I'm not going to challenge anyone's desire or passion for wrestling, but I'm going to say, if you're not trying to fill your diary every weekend, if you're happy doing wrestling once a month, and that's your fill, and you're happy with that, it's like, is it really your passion, your desire, and your, and your, and your are you really that, that devout? Like for me, wrestling's always been the constant in my life. So from when I was a kid at school, I wasn't really paying attention to what they were doing. I was writing angles in my notepad, and I've got notepad upon notepad at home of storylines and angles and stuff like that. So I've just write in my notepad constantly. Monday, then I'd write, I'd do SmackDown, and then I'd do Raw, and then I'd do SmackDown, and had all the old talent and everything in there. It was all just written out, and, and constantly just writing and writing and writing. And then when I got into wrestling, it was like my life. You know, it still is to a degree now. Yeah, I'm a family man. I'm a father. I'm a husband. You know, and I look after my my family, and the, my family will always come first to a degree. But my my love, my love for wrestling is is unwavered. Do you know what I mean? It's it's always been there, no matter what happens in your life. I can put on wrestling. And wrestling's my escape from everything. Whereas, like, if that's not your passion project, and you don't want to move and and go after it, I can't understand you from a standpoint of going in and risking breaking your neck for something you don't love that much. Or you don't even take it. it doesn't make any sense to me. And I say, I was talking about, because obviously me and Lou, we do the miles together in the car a lot. We drive up and down the country. We're top of Scotland. We're down south. We're at Target. We're in Scotland, W3L. We're down at WAW. We're at Rise. We're at Kumite. We're at like, Bleeding Gum. So we're pretty much everywhere and anywhere we can go to sort of get the reps in and, and, and get the rest in. So someone calls us and says, oh, can you wrestle here? It's a 10-hour drive. Can you do it? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Of course we can. We're on our way. Do you know what I mean? And this is, this is the thing. And I know if I call Lou and say, got a show on today, we're going here. He goes, spot on, let's go. There's never any sort of waiver of, oh, I want to do it, mate, but you know what? I've got to get my hair cut at 1 o'clock. I'm thinking... Like, really? Like, you come to me and say, you want to meet this promoter, you want me to introduce you to this promoter and stuff like that, and then you say another day to go up, uh, you know, I've got to go to Tesco's and get me a shopman in and that. It's like, Tesco's is 24-7. You know, we go and you get back. It, it, it's, it's just one of those things. You just say, like, I'd, I, I wouldn't say I, I question anyone's passion or desire for the job, but I do say sometimes if you're happy with doing very minimal 
then unless you want to be out there all the time doing it every time and every time you get an opportunity to do it you don't snap that opportunity up it's like why do something like this half-assed when there's other people chomping in the bid for that spot that you're taking up that one spot and somebody who, who wants it who needs to get that fix you know what I mean that, that would do that and I, I just don't understand them people so yeah, like I said, I mean, I, I, I speak to somebody beforehand, and it kind of reminds me a little bit of like, you know, you'd have to, you'd have to like even guess, you know, like I was talking to someone, you know, when, when you stood behind your curtain before you go out, and you know, you got the butterflies, you know, regardless of how long you've, you've been doing it, you should always have those butterflies because it means you're excited, yeah. it means you care. Um, those kind of people, I can imagine, just yeah, not having the butterflies, just going out and doing it for the sake of doing it, kind of thing. Or so, so it's, goes, it so sounds cool. I think it depends on what the butterflies is. Because some people say, oh, if you don't feel nervous before you go through the curtain, you shouldn't do it because you don't care. Like I haven't felt nervous for a long time, but as soon as you have that excitement, goes, though, you, surely you feel that excitement. Butterflies, to me, it's not just nerves; it's excitement. You're that's what I mean. Oh, I'm always, I'm always happy to get out there and do it. But I yeah. mean, it's for me, it's like because I've got custom made theme music, and it has starts off with a big bow at the beginning, and I always say, as soon as that bow goes, it's business, and, and that's what triggers me to go bang it out, ready, let's go. You know what I mean? I just love the kick in the uh, custom made music for me, and it's like I love it because it's. I was always a big fan of the way the bowl came about was the fact that I remember back at entrance music back in the day you had Bret Hart the screech of the guitar, you had like the Hogan the guitar riff, you had Austin the glass smash, the rock you smell what the rock is cooking, Triple H is it's time to play the, you know they all had this cool fucking thing to go, they're here this is they're here now, and then I thought for me it's like got to be that bowl. I'm a massive fan of JBL as well. So when I had the bull on mine, similar to what he had, I was like, oh, that's class. And then I ah. had that bull now. So every time the bull hits, people know I'm coming. And then after that's that, it, it's just awesome. like an 80s, it's like 80s WCW guitar riff. Dun, 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 dun. And that's just, yeah. but that's it. Never, yeah, it's just that sudden, as soon as you hear it, you know, don't you? I've never really, oh, obviously yeah. I've thought about it, but it's never really sunk in or I've never overly thought about it. But yeah, like I said, all the great theme songs have just got that three or four seconds where it's like, bam. It's the identifier it's like, for the two, oh, two yes. three seconds. Like Undertaker's, for instance, John Cena's, everyone, everybody, entrance music has that three second great sort of that you, as soon as it hits you, go, oh, fuck it, Ellie's here. I know yeah. he's here. Do you know what I mean? And that's sort of what I wanted with the bull. I wanted the bull to be the sort of signifier that the outlaws oh. here, the lone stars here, or do you know what I mean? And that sort of stuff. But no, for me it was it, it, that. That was what stuck. And that's the only thing I really. That was my only instructions. I just said I want something that really like a bull that can stand out from every other music, and then something like eighties WCW music. He's like, yeah, no worries. And that's what I got. So I couldn't be happier with it. Perfect. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. Nobody's going to mistake it for anybody else's song. That's the thing. No, it's that's unique. It. It's like, yeah, straight away, yeah, you hear it. You're like, okay, yeah, we know who's coming. Just that's going it. up kind of thing. Um, JBL, you mentioned uh, JBL fan. Yeah. Um, JBL APA or the new blue Blackjacks or the uh, Millionaire I mean, from JBL. Justin or- Bradshaw. From Justin Hart Bradshaw onwards, yeah. uh, I was a massive fan of JBL, like Bradshaw. I think it's because the way sort of he's built, he's a big guy, like the follow-away slams, the big lariats, the big clothesline, stuff like that. So, like, for me, growing up, I wouldn't say that Bradshaw was my favourite wrestler of all time, but I did grow up watching him, and then I got the more, as I developed my own sort of character and into it, I got to appreciate his stuff a lot more as a wrestler that I did as a fan, if that makes sense. So like when I was growing up, it was always Bret Hart, Owen Hart. Do you know what I mean? The Hearts, because I was um, growing up in Canada. So you, you're always wanting to back the Hearts and you believed in everything that happened. And, you know, and even when they did the, the Bret was a heel in America and 
And if you were like, oh, you know, Americans are not like us, they don't have family values, they don't have this. And it was sort of getting that sort of, even though you're a teenager now, you're in school or whatever, you're like, oh, no, they're Americans, they're bastards, they're Americans. And that. But uh, none of us have ever met an American where I grew up, it was only a small little town. And as you know, nobody's even met an American, they're like, oh, fucking Americans, they're dirty bastards, they are. Uh, if, well, if Brett says it, it must be true. You're like, well, if Brett says it. That's it. It was one of the great promo moments, but that's one of the people don't realise. It's all about, like, wrestling for me is always about the moment. So, like, the moment where Davy Boy and Owen are fighting and Brett comes out and says, hey, stop, stop, this is what they want. They want to see our family fighting. They want to see us going against each other. They want to see us tear us apart because that's what these people like. The Jerry Springers of the world and stuff like that. They want to watch families go at it. You know, I mean, we're not like that. And then it's like, he talks about it, you know, he goes back to what he's, Oh, you know, the teacher was giving you a hard time. I went down to school. I sorted the teacher out for you, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah, and you know, Davey, when this was happening, who was there for you when this happened? And, you know, it's that old moment where it's like, really, you can relate to it because, you know, who hasn't ever had a fight with their brother or their sister? And they're done. Who's been there for you since day one? You don't fucking listen to me. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's sort of the thing where it plays on you. And look at that going, yeah, it really feels that. But it's like, it's the importance of creating those moments in promos and stuff like that is always key. But I think too many people now try to just be funny in a promo. And I just, I'm not a fan of it. The heels don't want to be heels anymore. They want to be funny. They want to get people laughing at them, which it's all right if you're a heel and certain individuals find you funny as a heel, as a character funny itself. But the heel for me should always have no good qualities about them. Being funny is a good quality. You know what I mean? If you're, now, if you're arrogant and you're an idiot and you, you're bullying someone and you're taking the piss out of that person and the other person, and, and someone in the audience finds it funny, then that's on them. But really, it's like the majority of the crowd should be in. Whereas too many people go out now and they get on the mic and they go, oh, you do this or you do that or you this or that or the other. And they go on, you're trying to get me to laugh. I don't want to laugh. Like, you know what I mean? And it's the same thing, like, people don't realise that the idea of doing a promo, especially, like, the backstage promos when you're shooting them from your car or wherever you're shooting from, it doesn't matter where you're shooting from as such. It's better to do them somewhere that's decent and you don't have the wind blowing in your microphone. But when you do do the promos, and that, you're hyping up the fight. Like, you, you never see a boxer go on and go, well, now and again you might, but sometimes the majority of it's, you know, I know you're a great boxer. I know you're a good boxer, but I know I can beat you. Yes. You know what I mean? And, it, it means something. It means something. You pick your opponent up. It means more when you beat them. That's it. And that's if they beat you, then you know that. Like they always said that the, the blue eye, the baby face, the good guy, should never guarantee to win a match. But they should always guarantee to give everything they've got to win that match. And a heel can pretty much guarantee it. Because they know, no matter what you do, I won't beat you. No matter what, because I'm always five steps ahead and I'll do whatever it takes. Do you know what I mean? And and that's the thing. And, and that's where you blur the line of the heel will cheat to win, but a baby face, a good guy, won't do that. So when the heel cheats to win, he's crossed that line. And yeah, he's got the win, but he's done it. And that circles back to how important the referee is. So it's saying like how a good referee makes it because... I think there's too many people shit on the referees in a match where the referee loses all credibility. That if later on in the show, the main event's relying on the, the referee to have credibility, well, that 50-pound lad earlier on told the referee to go fuck himself, and the referee just looked at him and went, come on now, don't do that. And I have referees constantly go to me and goes, do you think they mugged me off there? And I go, no, I think you mugged yourself off because you should have just rang the bell. Said you're disqualified. You don't lay hands on the referee. Or you don't do this. And yeah, the promoter might get hot. But you'd say to the promoter, well, listen, I'm doing my job. He is not doing his job. So the, your gripe really is with the guy. And if it's a promoter who doesn't see that, it goes, like, I'm not saying if the guy shouts at you and says, oh, shut up, ref, you're going to go on to disqualify him. Do you know what I mean? But if it's constant and constant and constant, like, I'll always say to the referees, like, I'll beg them. And I'll be doing something where I'll like be cheating in the corner, choking them in the corner or something. They go, five seconds, Tim. That's five seconds. Get out. I told you to get out. I'm gonna get I'll call them back. I'll go, sorry, sorry. I got carried away. I apologize. I'll back it down from the referee because I know they can ring the bell and then I lose. I don't want that. And it gives them their authority back. 
it's like a lot of times now as well that people don't let the, the referee catch them cheating. Do you know what I mean? Like, you go, and I'll get the cowbell. I'll go, oh, I'm going to kill him with the cowbell. And the referee will grab the cowbell off me and say, you'll have to use that cowbell. And they'll put it back in the corner. Do you know what I mean? It's just little things like that they can do that just gives that ref that little bit of control in the match. So they have that control. So if you rely on it later on. So the, the, the thing for me would be, I'll get the cowbell and I'll go and I'll say, I'm going to hit him with the cowbell. And the referee will pull the cowbell away and put it there. And then later on, I'll pull the turnbuckle pad down and say, the turnbuckle pad's wrong, the turnbuckle pad's wrong. I'll get the cowbell, and the, the, the guy will be down, I'll go to hit him with the cowbell. And then the guy catches my hand and grabs the cowbell off me. Now he's going to hit me with the cowbell. And now I'm screaming, ref, 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 help, ref, ref, ref. The ref turns around and sees him with the cowbell. Yeah, you, I've told you both, nobody's using that cowbell. And straight away, the referee is impartial. Done the same to him as he's done to me. The referee has full control of the match. But he's created that sort of sense of the referee though is 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 calling it all fair. He's not using it. He's not using it either. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it creates that credibility in the referee. And then later on down the line, if the if the main event needs to use that, then they've got that created already. Whereas if everyone goes out and just shits on the referee, by the time the referee goes out, it's like, well, what credibility does the referee have now? What sort of power do they have? I had this discussion with, um, I think it was um, Adley Thomas and Sandy Beaches on a while ago, uh, yeah. and we discussed yeah the importance of keeping Great the integrity, the, you know, keeping the integrity yeah, of the authority. You need that authority yeah. there for it to mean something. It's when something it's that, that's, but, but that's what I mean. It's like the same thing as well as if you're trying to sell an, an injury, or, or you're trying to put over. And I think everyone who listens to this podcast already knows about wrestling. Good guys, bad guys. How about just the, the bad guys? It's revealed. All the secrets are revealed here today. No, but I mean, it's like, if I take a spill over the top rope as a big guy, if I'm playing a blue eye, I go for the larry and I miss, I go over the top rope below bridges me, I jar my knee, I pull my knee pad down, I'll tell the referee, you know what I mean, instead of starting to count me straight away, just jump out the ring, check on me, make sure I'm all right. I'll say my knees out. He can come, you can push him back. So go back, go back to your corner. And that creates that, that 10 seconds creates that, is he hurt himself? Because the referee's not just gone straight into the one, two. It's now become a part of the question, the legitimacy. And for that split second, you then, the disbelief. And then when you crawl up to the ring and you get in the ring, and as soon as you get in the ring, he starts attacking your leg. You know what I mean? Straight away, you're fighting up, you're fighting up. He gets the leg, he gets the leg, he gets the leg. And that's when you're getting the sympathy because no matter what he does, you're still trying to get back on your feet. And he's just taking that leg every time. Every time you try to get the advantage, he takes the leg. But I think there's too many people just want to go out and do a high spot after a high spot. And, and if the refs are in the way, then it's the ref's fault. And, and this is, and you think, and well, it's, the ref's got to do their job. But then on the other side of that, you get some people are out there who, where they just chuck some promotions, just chuck a shirt to a random guy, I think, and say, hey, you, do, you, you, can you ref? Ref what? Here's a shirt. Go on, give it a bash. Because some of them go in, they don't have a clue what they're doing. And for those places, I won't go back because the thing for me is if I go in and I hurt myself, I need a referee to be able to react to me getting hurt and get me help or assistance, not just go look like lost. Do you know what I mean? If I get dropped in my head, or if someone else gets hurt, I need that referee to be able to react. Because if you get land on your head and you get knocked out, you've only got a few seconds to get someone in the right position and, and that before they can choke on the tongue, or before they can get hurt. Or is that's the importance of having a referee in the ring that knows what they're doing. They don't have to be first aid qualified. But God damn, let them have some idea of what's going on out there. Do you know what I mean? And let them have some the wits about them. Don't just put any any idiot in a shirt and say it's bad enough when they they get in the way of the spots or they they mess up the the bits that they're supposed to do that you can live with. Do you know what I mean? But it's the same thing. It's like if they're out there and someone seriously gets hurt, that's when you need to go. Come on now. So oh, yeah, you need help. somebody like that. That and that'll come with experience. You know, that'll come with just common sense. You got somebody who's just put the shirt on and doesn't know. Yeah, they're not going to have that common sense. They're not going to have that experience. 
it would be like second nature to like the people that we've mentioned to kind of thing, you know, the rest that we've mentioned. hundred percent. Anything but goes miss. times you, you go down and then there's countless good referees out there that as soon as you hit the mat off a, off a big fall or something, especially as a big if I take a big fall straight away, are you okay? Everything all right? And then check it on you, make sure everyone's okay. And it's good because you know then you're in safe hands, whereas if people don't bother, and say, and I've had so on one instance where I was wrestling so one. I was bleeding out my ear. I didn't even realise. And Katie came and said, Tim, you're bleeding. And I said, I'm all right, don't worry about it. Because I was fine anyway. I knew it was just like a... Because I wasn't really disoriented. I never really got hit in the head or anything. I think it was just a, a scratch or something off the ropes or something on my ear that made it bleed or whatever. Because I bleed like, all the time. So it sort of doesn't really... I hurt my ear on the ropes. So I'm going to rip my ear, cut my ear. And that was just, that's why I was bleeding. So I knew it wasn't serious. But she was like, you're bleeding. I was like, well, I can't feel it. So if I can't feel it, it's not serious. Yeah. So it's like, I'm good. Like, if it was gushing, I'd probably go, all right, come on. <laughs> it, was, it was the knowledge, the fact that they checked, that speaks well, volumes. Well, that's what I mean. It's like, it's, yeah. That's the thing, is like asking and checking and making sure you're all right. That's the key to it. And so the referee is probably one of the most important people out there because they're there to make sure people are safe aid and assist the match so the more you can include the referee in your match the more you build to the match the more the match would you could add to it it's like saying if you had a show you were doing a two people show on broadway how great would that two person show be if you added a third person and you have three people on the show now if all three of them know their lines and are experienced actors could it be a hell of a better show than if it was just one or two of them knowing the lines and doing everything and that's that's the key to it it's all about making sure the story is told. If you can add another character in the story, that's going to help add that bit more of. If you've got good and bad, and you can add that sort of judgment in the middle, that that sort of it, impartial to both. It's uh, like the fans, yeah. It's like the conscience, you know. Like you say, you got the good and evil. You got that. That the referee is the line, yeah. You know, due cost the line. But what side of the people. line do you stand on? But if you don't, if you don't give credibility to the referee, then when you cheat, it doesn't matter, it mean anything. And when the referee does something, it doesn't mean anything because nobody's given the referee credibility. That's so it. Um, before I forget, uh, I'm just keeping an eye on the time because I'm not coming up to uh, an hour and I said I'd keep you for about an hour. Um, when I was we speaking earlier, um, you said that would have mentioned, obviously, WAW. Um, yeah. But I'll ask, um, I sent you over some matches. Obviously, you know, I sort of said that you'd wrestled like... Uh, five matches in 15 days or something yeah uh, but there's like a couple of days apart each one and that kind of got my attention because obviously most people do one show a month or one show every you know three months but this yeah. is like waw did a show like every two days or something for two weeks or yes so waw tend to have they have their own performance center down there they run regular shows so they run the the academy shows which has some great upcoming talent on there and then they run the the main shows as well so when I say the performance center down there, it gets about 300 people in. Do you know what I mean? So it's it's the regular people there to follow the guys and know the guys and buy into it. And they've got a great setup down there. And they've always been good to me, the Knight family and WAW. So we go down there when we can. So this time, I think they, had, they were doing a bit of mixture of the regular shows. And then they were filming uh, some TV pilot stuff as well. So it was like sort of going down there every two days to do the, the recordings and then all the recordings were done so you'd go down a weekend do the recordings then go down the next weekend do the recordings again and then because it was like a five hour drive if there was a show on the Saturday me and Lou would stop down and then do the show on Saturday as well as the Friday so we made the most of the travel and the trip down so and then if there was a show on the Sunday as well we'd do that as well so it's sort of whenever we it's like what I said if there's any shows going we'll do them you know what I mean? It's like if there's any shows anywhere, we'll be there if we're not somewhere else. So it's 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 always that sort of mentality we've got. But I think that's the the reason behind that. But I mean, it's it's always great to go down there anyway because you've got some great new talent because they've run so often as well. They've got a lot of guys getting a lot of good reps, and they've got a lot of good outside talent. We did a show there Saturday. They had EC3 in from defending the NWA World Title. Uh, again, it's Drew Marshall, who's great talent, and things like that. So it's like they get all these people in. Like, but when you've got the Knight family, you've got like Roy Knight, 
Zach when he's here, Soraya when she's here, Ricky Knight Jr., who's just amazing. You know, you have people like Brett Semtex, who's not related. You've got PJ Knight, who's, who's part of the family. They're all sort of amazing athletes already, but there's so much knowledge and so much stuff. You go and you sit down, and like after the match, they'll give you feedback and they'll, they'll tell you. You know, you did this, you try to do this, you try, and you're always improving down there as well. So even on the little tiny things that you might miss out on, they're always there to help you and guide you through and things like that and help you always sharpen your game, which is what I like. You know, I mean, even after 20 years of doing it, it's nice to have people say, you know, you know, why don't you try this or think about this? And when you think about it, you go, know, yeah, that makes sense. You know what I mean? But it's still those, and I like the fact that even though being a ball wrestler, being passionate wrestler, and being a a student of it and studying it for as long as I have, there is still those eureka moments to be had out there even now. It, like and that, I was told that from very early on. Like you never stop learning in wrestling. You're always learning. That's still true to this day. Like you're always sort of I mean, that that's the, the key to it is always learning. I think we've had, we have done time i think but i think we can do a quick fire bit because i know there's a lot of stuff we want to cover off i um, think we touched on did we dude yeah i think you know it's just uh i'm not too i mean we can always you know if you're i'm happy it, we'll, to go we'll, i'm happy to go like i, I can talk for ages so i'm happy to go <laughs> if you need to talk just, but it's, it's just no, i've got to keep it within like a certain restraints for me to be able to edit it and you know upload it and stuff but yeah what i'll always say is you know it's an open door policy you know after after we've chatted today, if we're like, oh crap, we didn't talk about this, we didn't talk about this, then you know what, you know, I'll talk to you again in a couple of months if that's all right, and we'll oh, talk yeah, about it again, fine. kind of thing. Uh, so, I'm always, I'm always up for part two. Um, but yeah, also yeah, I, so that did get my attention with the uh, WAW thing was just like yeah, the yeah. proximity of the matches and stuff. It kind of got my attention. Um, so there's, there's days in the summer where you could do a show every day on the camps and stuff like that. That's how it used to be years ago. You'd be doing six shows a week, sometimes double shows in certain days. And I think it's not like that now, but it's like it's, but I don't think a lot of people have the hunger for it now, the what you did back in the early 2000s. Like that, that's the thing that I said before, is like the social media aspect of it all now, where it's, I remember when I first started, it was like, get some 8 by 10s done, get some VHSs, some cassettes and start sending cassettes to people and then it was like start sending dvds to people and then now it's like send a link to people and then all you have to do is put it on the line and, and send a link to someone and they go, oh, you've got that match it's and everyone can watch it now so it's yeah. which is great do you know what i mean it's, it makes it so much easier accessible but you gotta understand that it's when you have to be even more hungry for it now because there's that many people can get into the or it's not like before where you'd have to be local or you'd have to have an in with someone. Like Iceman helped me a lot when I first started because he used to take us on the road with him and we, I used to go and do matches with him, like whether it be traveling to Newcastle upon line or, or traveling up in, in Scotland ways and stuff like that. So when he trained me when I first moved to England and he took me up there and stuff, so it was like I got connections through there, through there I met the Knights and through... There I ended up going to Skegness, and through when I went down to Skegness, they were there doing camps with me, the same sort of team. So it's like, then you build the relationships with people, and now you got you, you look at it now, and you go there and say, "How long have I known you?" Like speaking to Zach before, and I say, "Well, how old were you?" I think he was what eighteen, nineteen when I met you. He's like, "I was 13. and you look back and you think, "Like, cause I've known you a majority of your life." You know what I mean? You know these people for a long, long time. And just the years fly over when you're looking at it. So the UK Pitbulls, like Dave and Mike, you know, both, they're, they're still going now and still amazing to watch, you know what I mean? And it's still great to see those guys out there doing it. So when I catch up with them at CXW, it's always good to see those guys as well. You know what I mean? And that's sort of when you, when you go and you might not see someone for three months, four months, and then all of a sudden you're on a show with them. And it's like you haven't missed a day. Do you know what I mean? And it's, it's things like that that, that make it. Like it's, it's a touch on like the same thing. I get the the family thing from like the, the death match guys. I bring up from Joe, Darko, Lou. You know what I mean? Caden. 
like Danny O'Doherty, like all the guys from Rise, and then from the like, Call of Death match guys, but a lot of them are, are talent guys who wrestle any type of show, family show, 18 plus, but they're known for like death match stuff. I think it's because I've had a good relationship with Lou anyway, and, and with these guys, but they always, i never seen a more supportive bunch like online, and that's so good to see and so refreshing in a world of backstabbers and snakes to have this core of guys that just support each other and everything they do. And there's not an ounce of jealousy in any of them. They're just so happy to see their friends do well. It's so great to see, whereas you see so many other people that are just like, play the room. So if they like you in that room, then they like you. But if they don't like you in that room, they don't like you. Do you know what I mean? These guys are all sort of, they're always true themselves. They always stand up for their friends. They're always there and they're always supportive. And they're all so many great guys. And you know what I mean? It's so good to, when you get on shows with these people, these types of people, because there is no egos, there is no bullshit. You're all there for the sake of the show and put on the best show possible. And yeah, you'll have a laugh and you'll wind each other up and you take the piss, but it's all from a place of love. You know what I mean? Like you would with your brothers or your close friends. It's not really. You know it's not I mean? nice. I, exactly. There's no malice behind anything. It's yeah. just a bit of fun. But I think that's like what what where wrestling could be a lot better is is I wouldn't say being more inclusive because it's probably too inclusive sometimes. But I think being and by with that I mean it's a, it's 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 people who are happy to take money off trainees and people like that who without being open and honest with them, saying, listen, you might get on some local shows. You might be able to do this to this level and stuff like that. But you really need to improve drastically if you want to get out there, if you want us to put your name out there rather than just learn around because they'll come to train and they'll pay their money every week. You know what I mean? And if people are on, on say, I've seen sometimes where people are saying, so what I, what I mean by that is not that people are lacking physical ability or anything like that because that can be trained. But it's when people have medical issues where they're known to, to pass out frequently and randomly. Like, you couldn't feel safe in a match with someone who could pick you up, but they might pass out. While they're hot, you know what I mean? Or you're in a match with someone mm-hmm. and they're passing out. Or if you know someone's prone to stro- strokes, and you're still letting them compete in the ring. And you're going, if the guy's had strokes in the past and the doctor's not cleared him to wrestle, if he's in there with me or with anybody and something happens to him, yeah, we'd be there to help him and protect him the best we can. But he should never be in that position. And it's not the same as him saying, well, he's happy to do it. Yeah, well, he might be. <laughs> but I'm not happy with having that on my conscience that if I go out there with someone and they pass out and, and hurt themselves or hurt me, why would I want to put myself on that risk? And that's what I mean when I say it's, it's probably too inclusive. Like obviously everything else that's going on in the world, it's great to see everyone come together and, and stuff like that. But I think when that sort of element of it, when people shouldn't health-wise be in the ring, it's probably not a best that's place for them. Safety is always key. Do you know what I mean? Anything. But as I say, it's, it's when you have these people like that, and they're all when you have like the people like the Deathmatch Outlaws, like the people like that, the supportive network that they have. It, it, as I say, it's refreshing to see in a world of a lot of people stab you in the back for a payday. Do you know what I mean? I've had people do it to me before when I was in, I was in for, I had sepsis in my leg. I had surgery on my leg back in the last year. In October, which I missed like a month of shows, which was a killer for me because I was stuck in the house. But it was a, I was back at it within a month. But I had guys contacting promoters saying, I don't think Tim will be back in time. I'll take a show if he can't do it and stuff like this. And you're going, how can you be so shady? Do you know what I mean? And do that. Yeah. And know. when you know, like I said to the promoters, I just said, like the promoters knew, they came to me and said, we've got this guy and he's doing it. But... And I just said, well, if anyone's going to tell you that I won't be able to make a show, it'll be me. But the only time I've ever missed a show in 20 years was when I had that done to my leg. And I was wounded to miss it because I was supposed to be wrestling Zach Knight on the weekend, on the Saturday. And I wrestled four shows the weekend before. 
and I thought it was a shin splint, and then it ended up swelling right up to where it was like a big blister, a black blister on my leg, and I ended up having sepsis and necrosis in my leg. So I had to go and have two emergency operations. And I even said to the doctor on the Thursday, he said the operation will be Friday. I said, is there any chance I can get discharged? Go and do the shows and then come back. And he's like, no chance. And I was saying, all right. And I told him I couldn't make the show well in advance. But I said, if I can, I will be there. But I don't think I will be there. And all they were saying was, don't be stupid. You need to get yourself 100%. Your health is more important for your family and your kids. But... For me, it's like even sitting at home, it's like if I have a weekend off, like I love spending time with my family, don't get me wrong, but it's like I do miss wrestling yeah. when I'm not wrestling. And then I think that's the, the passion key of it, but it's finding that work-life balance because you want to have, you don't want to miss your kids growing up. So yeah. you need to have, like, I try to do a couple of weekends off or a couple of days off, some days off or something a month where I don't do anything. So I've got that if I come back for Saturday, if I'm resting Friday, Saturday, I come back and I've got Sunday off with the kids. So it's the day the phone's off, everything's off, and it's just family time, no interruptions. And I think that's sort of the, the key to find it. Like, I and my wife, Rachel, like, she's not into wrestling at all. <laughs> but she, she knows that I love it, so she supports me. So obviously everything I do would never be possible without obviously her supporting me and the boys obviously even though they're they're four and one and, and I've got other boys seven, they sacrifice sometimes weekends with dad. I've got my two daughters who are twenty and nineteen, they don't care. But you know, I mean they like, they don't unless they want money, I don't care from them. But it's uh like the boys sacrificing the time and stuff and they don't they don't, they don't realise the sacrifice but it's some they know that they, the mother is there to support me on it and stuff. So it's it's good to have that support network as well because yeah. it can be hard. Like, I'll come home and sometimes it's like, oh, you're wrestling there. I've watched your wrestling there from last night. It's on the radio. There's something that's done for you. It's food in the fridge. It's food in the microwave. Text us when you're there. Do you know what I mean? And it's sort of like, and it's hard because like, I'll be away some weekends, overnight all weekend, and she's here after working all week. She's now home with the boys all weekend. Do you know what I mean? And then having to entertain uh, the five-year-old who's very hyper. And then obviously look after the, the one-year-old at the same time. It, it is. It is hard. But it's the... I said, man, you, you, it's obviously very lucky, you know, to, to have that support. I said it oh, wouldn't yeah. be doable. It would not be doable if she wasn't 100%, you know, supportive and behind you. Uh, well, that's key. You know, that's, like I said, it's finding that balance, uh, and obviously you've got that balance because you know I don't think you should put up with it if you didn't. It would be yeah. of like that. No. I would know. I would know. If there, but there, there does some come time. So obviously we're going to Florida in May for a family holiday, and I have a I have a booking when I'm over in Florida, resting in Florida in May. So it's like, but we're there for a family Disney holiday. So I had an opportunity to have more bookings. She said, you can have one, and that's your lot. That's your lot, and you're lucky I'm giving you that, because it's supposed to be weeks with the boys and the family, and I was thinking, okay, which is, I'll let you have that one, and I was thinking, that's fine. I appreciate Thank you, man. That's, so, that's going to be awesome. I'll keep my eyes out for that one. But yeah, dude, uh, I think we're gonna definitely going to have to do a part two, because I've not even touched on you know, the Mighty yeah, Cyrus. Karaoke tunes or whatever. So, hold oh, down, um, down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, dude, um, plug your socials. You know, where can people find you? Where can they see what you're doing, what you've been up to? Mr. Tim Strange on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter or X. And that's uh, MR Tim Strange. So it's, it's not hard to find. I'm there. You tag me and stuff anyway. So if they're listening, yeah. You, you know, follow the link. What That's I it, say, yeah, part two, part three, part four. We might actually touch on some subjects. I'll try Mate. not to go on a rant. Dude, I, I love it, but honestly, the, the less I have to talk, the happier I am. So it's perfect for you. you know. Lou, won't have to, Lou won't have to listen to this podcast because he's, he would have heard all of this in the car <laughs> several times. <laughs> and me just ranting about how the world is. But, you know, it's, 
it's good. But shout That's out it. to a lot of the guys out there as well who put the work in. PPW training yeah. facilities. Shout out to Lou Nixon. Big Chris at Full Tilt Wrestling as well. He's a good guy. He did a triple the other other week. Everyone really. There's so many good people out there at the minute. So That's it. I blessed, think it's a too blessed to be stressed. Too blessed to be stressed. <laughs> and then it will there's, there's a lot of people out there, and a lot of great talented people like like Kemper's coming through. I'm looking forward to wrestling him. Saxon Huxley's out there killing it. Such a good guy, such a great guy as well. And just like so many good people doing so many good things, so many amazing, you know, what I mean, talented people coming up through the ranks that you see and at shows. And you're going to give him two years, and he'll be. Amazing, and you're watching it all unfold, and it's such a beautiful thing to happen. So it's good. No man, British wrestling. It's uh, definitely um, on the alive and well. It's, it's, it's good doing well. there. Um, but yes, obviously, if you're not following Tim, follow him. You know, I'll put all the links on the posts. Uh, go, if you see Tim on a show near you, buy, you know, get a ticket, go watch, go and enjoy. Just go see a big man slapping meat and just throwing chops um, and just an being... Lariat. I've got an chops and mustache and a lariat, that's it. Oh. What more do you oh, need? I've got, it's just I've got a, I've got a <laughs> selection of cowboy hats. So, um, which hat will you wear tonight? <laughs> that's what you want to know. What's that dude? <laughs> which, which cowboy hat is he going to wear tonight? That's the anticipation for when you come oh. to see Tim Strange. That's a selling point. Yeah. That's your merch right there, man. Next time I go to a show and you're on the show, if I don't see cowboy hats on the merch table. Do you know how hard it would be to carry around boxes of cowboy hats to shows? <laughs> you fucking mentalist. That's <laughs> never going to happen. It's <laughs> never going to happen. There's not enough boot Dang space it. for cowboy hats, unfortunately. <laughs> but one it. day. One day. Uh, but- Hit like, hit subscribe, share, comment, do all the generic stuff you do after watching the video on YouTube. Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously keep your eyes peeled for future episodes. We were just on about Bret Hart before. Uh, myself and JC will be doing a review of the Canadian Stampede in a couple of weeks in our 97 wrestling review. So I've got that to look for. I've been looking. The only reason I, I did 97 wrestling, oh, the only reason great. I did 97 wrestling was to watch Canadian Stampede again. So it's yeah, great, great show. Good. It's. Easily one of it's in my top do you watch, five shows. Do you watch the whole show or do you just watch yeah. the main event? No, I watch it all. Watch it all kind of thing. Sure. We do WWE and WCW pay per views throughout, throughout 97. Because, um, yeah, it's mine and JC's favourite year for, for wrestling, basically. I let my kids watch wrestling up until November 97 and then they don't watch wrestling after that date. Yeah. They get up to November 97. I mean, they're not ready for that yet. No, <laughs> no, yeah. keep them young, keep them innocent. You know, that's no, you don't need the attitude. No, so, yeah, that's it. I'm going to leave them out as soon as they start watching the other stuff. I'll be, I'll be away. As soon as oh, Vince becomes you'll... evil boss, and then <laughs> Stone Cold starts lighting fires to his car and smashing his cars up. Yeah, I can only imagine what will happen to my cars. So I'm not gonna, not gonna risk. So, Good. Thank you so much. Um, no I will talk to them. Obviously, yeah, I've said all the generic stuff, so thank you for watching. Um, We'll be back soon. Um, Yeah, thanks for watching, and we'll see you again very soon. Goodbye. No worries. Thank you. See you soon.